Armchair History. I am Liz Fuller, and this week we're going to be doing Brunswick County Moonshining. This is the fourth in our five-part series on early 20th century Southport history, being presented in collaboration with Harper Library and Friends of the Library of Southport and Oak Island. So, so far in this series, we've talked about World War I, and the flu pandemic of 1918. Okay, I'm back. All right, we talked about uh, World War I and the flu pandemic of 1918 and how throughout both of these crises, the people of Southport pulled together uh, to face the unexpected challenges that were brought by war and disease. And then last week, we talked about women's right to vote, and we saw the people of Southport, especially the women of Southport, exhibit leadership to improve their, their living conditions and to gain their rights as citizens. So this week is going to be a little different. We're going to be talking about the culture of moonshine in North Carolina, and we're going to get some insight into the, the independence, the ingenuity, and the complexity of the people of Brunswick County and the rest of the state. This is our timeline for this week, and you can see it lasts about 100 years. And I do want to point out one uh, item that I added to the, to the timeline this week, and that is in 1858 with the invention of the mason jar. And that was an important milestone in moonshine history, which we'll be talking about more later. So uh, Frank Stevenson Jr. was a, he wrote a book on moonshining in North Carolina. His daddy was a lawman who found hundreds and hundreds of stills in North Carolina, and he took his son with him on many of those raids. And so he wrote a book about his experiences, and he said that moonshine was a part of the rural southern experience in North Carolina as much as apple pie, chitlin, and collards. Now, a lot of people think that moonshine was a reaction to prohibition. That the government said, you can't buy liquor. And so the people of North Carolina said, well, then we'll just make it ourselves. But that's actually backwards. People have been making moonshine in North Carolina for over 300 years, since the first Scots-Irish immigrants settled here. It was a tradition for them to make it back in the old country, and so they brought it with them. And I don't think they made it out of corn back in Scotland, but they pretty quickly figured out that that would work. And so moonshine became a way of life and a part of the culture of North Carolina. Now, North Carolina is part of what is called the moonshine belt, where most of the moonshine in the United States was produced. And Frank Stevenson, the man I told you about later, he says that there is not another state in the United States that has a richer, broader, deeper or more colorful moonshine history and heritage than North Carolina. So after our talk today, you might just agree with him. Another misconception about moonshining is that when prohibition ended, it ended, but that is not the case. The heyday of moonshining was really from the 1930s to the 1970s. And most people who grew up in here during that era knew someone somewhere who had a still, or they had encountered a still while traipsing through the woods. So as we go through today, if anything I'm talking about brings up any stories in your past, uh, I encourage you to share them. While I was working on this presentation, I had the good fortune to meet a woman named Kim Kimberly Clemens Cart. And she is from Holden Beach, and her granddaddy and his brothers were moonshiners back in the 1950s and the 1960s. So the man on the right is her granddaddy, Ernest Bland, and the gentleman next to him is her daddy, uh, Levy Clemens. Now, Kim shared some of her family stories with me, and she said I could share them with you. So I have a clip of part of a conversation that I had with Kim uh, where she was telling me a story. So before I start it, I just want to make sure if everybody could turn the volume. Uh, oh, you know what? Let me just share my screen again. I think I forgot to do something important so that you could hear it. I'm so, I apologize. All right. Sorry, I'm going to do that again. <laughs> 
course it doesn't work this time. All right, I think I'm set. So if everybody has their volume turned up, I'm gonna to try to play this uh, clip and hopefully you'll be able to hear it, okay? This is a story that Kim told me about the first time that her mother brought her father home to meet her grandfather, okay? So she's bringing her boyfriend home to meet her father and this is the story about that, okay? Back then, you know, when you like everyone had a steal, like it wasn't like a, I would say everyone, not everyone, you know, some people didn't participate in that. But, you know, mm -hmm. if you didn't participate, you knew somebody had a steal, you know, so many, everybody right. had one and same like. So, um, but you didn't tell everybody where your steal was. That was something you just didn't do. And right. for a lot of good reasons. And um, that's what my mom always told me that she knew that's how my grandfather liked my dad when she, the first time uh -huh. she brought him home he took him out and showed him where his steel was okay i hope you all could hear that i love that story because so the first time that her mother brought her father home to meet her parents her daddy took him out and, and showed him where his still was and i'm sure he offered him a sample to drink too and that's how her mother knew that he approved of him because he let him in on that family secret. So I love that story because um, it shows a lot about Kim's family, but it also shows how moonshining was a way of life and a point of pride among many North Carolinians. Now, Kim went on to tell me that her own mother and grandmother didn't know where the still was. So here he was showing it to her boyfriend, but he, she didn't know where it was. So that shows that moonshining was really very much a male culture. Now, I'm sure that her grandfather was trying to protect his wife by not telling her where the still was, but there was at least one occasion where that almost got her into some trouble. So on this at this time, some revenue men came to the house looking for Kim's grandfather. And when they came to the door, they said, you know, where's Ernest Bland? And she said, well, he's not here. And they said, well, we want to look around. And she said, well, knock yourself out. There's nothing here to, for you to see. And so they started looking around. Now, uh, Kim's Uncle Billy, which would have been uh, her, grandfather, her grandmother's 17-year-old son, he came over and uh, came next to his mom. Now, he knew where the still was because he'd had to help his daddy sometimes with the still. So while the revenue men are looking all around, he comes sidling up to his grandmother and he says, uh, Ma, uh, there is something here. And so she said, uh, well, well, where is it? And he said, uh, it's, in, it's in the grapevine. So apparently they had a huge grapevine growing outside their cabin and there was a case of moonshine hidden in there. So all of a sudden her grandmother went from being all cocky and saying, knock yourself out to really sweating and worrying that they were gonna find it. But the revenue men looked everywhere. Luckily they did not find the, the moonshine in the vine. They left without finding anything. But I, I have to imagine that when Kim's grandfather got home that evening, that her grandmother gave him a pretty good talking to. So another misconception about moonshine is that it's always been illegal. And actually it was legal up until the Civil War. The, uh, the Confederacy declared prohibition during the war because corn was, was so much needed for food that they didn't want people making moonshine out of it. And much of the whiskey that they had was needed for medicine and for anesthetic for the troops. But most men were away fighting in the war anyway, so there really wouldn't have been too many at home to make moonshine. Now, following the war, the government, as you can imagine, was broke. And so they decided to start taxing moonshine, much like George Washington did after the Revolutionary War. And for any of you that know how that turned out, it didn't work real well. So Congress uh, raised the tax to $1.50 a gallon in 1865. And then within a few years, uh, they had raised the tax so that it was a thousand times what the original costs were. So these men couldn't have afforded to pay it even if they had wanted to. And when you consider that it was a federal tax and they had just finished fighting a war with the federal government, they didn't want to. So that's when they moved the manufacturing out into the woods where it was hidden under the holly trees, under the, 
the bougainvillea, or the, not the bougainvillea, the rhododendron, where they couldn't be seen, and they distilled it at night, where the smoke would go up through the trees and wouldn't show up in the night sky, and they worked under the light of the moon, hence the name moonshine. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit of how a still works, how they make the moonshine, and mm, I think I have a little pointer I can point with or something while I'm working. Let's see. Mm, okay, I'll try. Okay, so this first part of the still here, this is what you think of as the still, and this is where they would put the mash, and that's what they use to make the, uh, the moonshine out of. And so that's usually cornmeal or rye and some yeast, maybe a little sugar and some water. And they would let that ferment depending on the temperature outside. It would determine how long that would have to sit and ferment. It could be a few days. If it was cooler, it could be a couple weeks, but down here, usually a few days. And that would start to ferment, as you know, then that means it would start to create some alcohol. Now, sometimes they would also, they would use sugar instead, depending on the, which was easier to get. Um, and that they would sometimes call sugar shine. Um, that, that's supposed to be not as smooth uh, as if they made it with corn. And technically it's really rum and not whiskey. So that's what they would put in there. They would light a fire underneath it and they would heat it up. And uh, that would then go, you can see it going through this, um, this arm. Let's see if I can make an arrow here. There we go. This cap arm, and then on down into this uh, thumper keg. So, you, uh, and then from the thumper keg, it would go over into what's called uh, a worm box, which you see right here. Okay. So the thumper keg is, that was on the, the better stills they had a thumper keg and what would happen is the mash would heat up and it would start to produce a steam and the steam would have alcohol in it because alcohol turns to vapor at a lower temperature than water does so you get the alcohol turning into steam it would go up to the still it would go through that cap arm and down into the thumper keg now this diagram is not exactly accurate it was the best i could get but that thumper keg um that this pipe here should be going all the way down into the water, like there. And it would come in as steam, and then it would condense and turn in back into water, into liquid. And then it would turn back into steam again as the heat would rise, but it would be a little purer. And the reason for that is when it would come out of the still with the mash, it would pick up some impurities from the mash. It would carry those impurities along through the cap arm, down into the thumper, it would go into the water, it would leave those impurities behind, and then it would uh, distill again, it would turn back into vapor, and it would go back up through this pipe, uh, and then into the worm box. And in the worm box, you'll see it's got a, uh, a coil, that's the worm, and what would happen is the vapor would go into that coil, and there's cold water in that box. So you can see that they're in this particular uh, con contrivance, they've got water being pumped in through down, coming down that ramp into this box and then coming out of it so that there's always water flowing in and out. And that's why stills are always near water. They need running water because they need cold water going into that worm box. And what happens is when that vapor goes through that worm and uh, hits that cold water, it turns back into a liquid form again and winds its way down and comes out into this filtered bucket. Okay? So that's pretty much how it works. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, so I'll tell you a few more things about it. Now, uh, one thing is these, these pipes that you see, the cap arms, those pipes that go from one to the next, those, you, you, you really want those to be copper. And the reason is if they used lead, uh, there would be uh, poisons really that would be leached out of the lead and into the moonshine. So you want those to be copper so that they can be, so because copper doesn't do that. And also because copper has some kind of antimicrobial properties and it doesn't carry germs as much. So what part of this is that you always want to, uh, if you're going to drink moonshine, I'm loose, I've lost my little cursor. If you want to drink, darn it, hold on got a little technical issue here. Well, 
If you want to drink moon, I can't do it. If you want to drink moonshine, uh, you should know who your um, moonshiner is because it really matters. Uh, there's a science and an art to this. So one of the things about moonshine is it's supposed to have a little more, the, there's two ways of looking at it. It's supposed to be smoother, but also some people think it has a kick to it. And that's because it's not aged. And uh, some people expect that kick. So some moonshiners would actually add ingredients to it to give it an extra kick because people thought that that was more authentic. And the things that they would add sometimes were things like um, rubbing alcohol, paint thinner, embalming fluid, bleach, or manure. So obviously those are very dangerous things. So again, this is why it's important to know your moonshiner if you're going to get moonshine. Now, that's the science of it. There's also an art to it. And the art comes in in the fact that as the moonshine, or as the uh, fluids go through the still, there's varying degrees of alcohol in them. So the very the first part that comes out of the still is called the foreshot. And that is basically methanol. And that's the stuff that's really dangerous. And that's because methanol will turn to a vapor at an earlier, lower temperature than the rest of the alcohol. So the first th stuff that comes through is called the foreshot, and that's methanol. And a third of a shot glass of that will blind you. And a full shot glass of it will kill you. So it's really not good. And so a good moonshiner will toss that four shot away. The next part that comes through is called the head. And that has some acetone in it. It won't kill you, but it will give you a hangover. You think acetone, I think of nail polish. So it's probably not a good thing. And then there's the heart. That's the ethanol, that's the good stuff, that's what people are after, and that's supposed to not cause a hangover and supposed to be good. And then there's the last part, and that's called the tails. It's which the tail end of the run, it's more bitter. So what a lot of moonshiners will do is they'll take the heads and the tails and they'll put it in the thumper keg. You see where there's a, a liquid there in the thumper keg? That can be water, um, but uh, if you put alcohol in there, then when it distills the second time, it will have an even higher uh, alcohol uh, proof in it. So it'll distill again and be even stronger. So a lot of times they'll put that back in there. So that's pretty much um, how it works. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Yes. Um, I did know why you kept using the term moonshine and you also said it was called moonshine after the in prohibition did they call it that before? yeah that's one of, that's that's one theory as to why it's called moonshine yep what did they call it prior to that i think they called it liquor they called it white lightning hooch oh yeah um thanks uh -huh. <laughs> I was just curious how, how long the process takes from from the beginning to the end. You know, I'm not really sure. I, I guess it depends on how much they're they're uh, cooking. That's a really good question. I'm not sure. It, I th Liz, I think it depends on the environment. Yeah. Warm okay. or cold. If it's warmer, it's faster. Okay. Yeah. What I wanted to say is uh, I've gone to a few. Uh, distilleries uh, here in, in Ireland and Scotland. And this looks like that, except uh, on the right-hand side, there would be another uh, filtering system, another worm box. Okay. Uh, one, two, or three of them, depending on whether you're talking about bourbon, Irish, or uh, Scotch whiskey. And it just comes out that tap uh, into a filtering system, which is another worm box. It takes longer and it's controlled in a in a distillery, but it, it the system is I mean the, the technology hasn't changed, I guess, in all those years. I that's interesting. Well and, and it is really it is an art as well as a science. I don't know how they do it in the in the official places, the the commercial places, but certainly when uh, a moonshiner is making their own, they have it, it, there's really an art to knowing um, 
when the four shot is done, when you've moved into the heads, when you've moved into the heart, when you've moved into the tail, that's really all subjective. That's where the moonshiner has to know based on his own experience, based on smell or, or look or feel or taste, that they need to know that. And again, that's where you need to know your moonshiner. And that's part of why I think when you think of Kim's story where her grandfather took her father out to see the still, he wanted him to see the his contraption, right? Look at this great still I built because he would have made it. And he also had him taste it. And that was an indication of look how skilled I am in making it. So his, his, you know, he was kind of saying, welcome to the family, but also this is a good family. You know, we know what we're doing. So there was that, that aspect to it. There's, there's one more, one more question on the uh -huh. chat was okay. how about moonshining today? Is it still happening? Uh, it does happen today, and you know, it's interesting, whenever I give this presentation in person, there's always someone uh, in the class, it seems like, who says, hey, I'm going to go try this myself. Uh, usually, I, I don't want to generalize, but it's always, so far, it's always been a man uh, who said, hey, that, that sounds like a good idea. I do have to say, it is illegal, um, so putting that out there, it's also uh, dangerous, uh, not just the, um, the alcohol itself, obviously, when you're talking about uh, the, the methanol versus the ethanol, you have to know what you're doing. Also, when you look at the, the still over there, um, it, it, you know, you, when you think about a closed environment, it does have a, a, a release with that cap arm coming out of it, but it's a contained environment. You're putting heat on there. You're building up a lot of pressure. You can have an explosion you can have uh, a fire. And that's why even before they took to the woods and hiding there still, they didn't do it in their home uh, because it could explode. So uh, moonshining, to answer your question though, moonshining does occur still today. It's not as prevalent as it was since the 70s. It's really died down. Part of that has been because of um, the increase, uh, marijuana kind of overtook uh, moonshine as being a, a way to make money and then um also it became easier in north carolina to uh to get and easier and cheaper to get alcohol from an abc store so it it's i'm sure it still exists today but it's not nearly as uh prevalent as it was in the 30s to the 70s liz you can actually go into a liquor store in western north carolina and buy a bottle of moonshine right and that's legal it's the, um, the illegality of it is that it's not, that taxes have not been paid on it. Um, also, there's some concern about um, it being made at home, but when you think about it, people can make wine and beer at home. So it's, it, it, there's the danger of it because it is more dangerous. And then also the fact that people are not paying taxes, that's always been the, um, the concern. But moonshine, yes, you can buy it legally now in um, North Carolina and uh, that's become kind of a big business. All right, anything else about this, um, this slide? All right. So I guess it's going from the filtered bucket into a mason jar? Yes. Yeah, either being tossed because it's the wrong stuff or stored in a, you know, to go back into the thumper keg or going into a, a container to be sold. And that's where the, the judgment part of the moonshiner comes into play. All right, I'm having trouble with my cursor, but as soon as I figure out how to get it back, I did it. Okay, now I can change screens. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, so I wanted you to understand how it was made so you could understand part of what happened as prohibition came in, because obviously it's different when you're making it. Oh, look, my, let me see if I can get rid of those, okay? Uh, I guess I have to. All right. Okay. So when you're making moonshine for your own use or for serving to your family and friends, you're going to be paying a different attention to the quality than if you were doing it mass produced or you were going to be sending it off to be bought and sold by strangers in the city somewhere that you never met. So when prohibition came along, 
uh, it completely outlawed the sale and uh, production of alcohol across the entire country. This was national prohibition. All the, the, the legal distilleries were shut down, all the breweries were shut down. Suddenly, moonshine was the only source of American-made alcohol. And as you can imagine, demand went through the roof. And many of the traditional moonshiners suddenly found themselves with a commercial business and they had trouble keeping up with that demand. The prices went way up. Um, they started producing more because they could sell it, they could make money. These are people that traditionally had very little money, so it was a really good deal for them. In addition to that, um, some big time criminals and uh, moved into it and started developing, uh, came into the illegal liquor business. And most of them uh, didn't care about quality, they, they cared about quantity. And even some established moonshiners that maybe had good reputations before started to cut corners to meet the high demand. Uh, people would skip the filters, they would uh, maybe not pay so much attention to the ingredients that went into it. And so the quality was not as good as it had been when people were making it for their own use. Um, but by the, then when prohibition ended in 1933, most of those short timers uh, moved out and most of the rot gut did too and the quality tended to improve at least among the people that knew what they were doing. So moonshine was made in just about every county in North Carolina, including Brunswick County. But the major production uh, throughout Prohibition was centered in just a few places. The majority was made in Western and Central North Carolina, especially in Wilkes County, which federal agents referred to as the moonshine capital of the world. There were also four counties in Eastern North Carolina uh, where millions of gallons of moonshine were produced. And you can see those up there. It was Northampton, Gates, Hertford, and Birdie counties were big producers of moonshine. And if you think about geographically these locations, in Wilkes County it's very mountainous, the soil is not very good, it's very difficult for farmers to raise crops to take to market, plus getting them there was very difficult, so they wouldn't have a good, say, corn um, crop that they could take in. But if they took that corn and they turned it into moonshine, uh, you know, just like preserving vegetables and fruits were, was done to preserve your crops, you could um, preserve your corn by turning it into corn squeezins. And they could take that to market. It was easier to transport and they could get a lot more money for it. They wouldn't get much money for taking their corn to market, but they could take, get a lot for selling their, their moonshine. So that's why in that part of the state, uh, it was a very poor part of the state, very remote part of the state, it became an attractive way to make money. In the northeastern part, if you think about that's uh, right near the Great Dismal Swamp. So it was an area where there was sufficient water for them to be able to make the, the moonshine. They had access to water easily. It was also very difficult for lawmen to get back into them in the swamp. So it was a good place for them to hide. So that's why that was an attractive place to make it. Now, uh, we didn't have too much organized moonshining down in Southport. There would be, people would have individual stills uh, small time stills, but sometimes when it got uh, too hot in those other areas, when the law got too intense, some of those larger syndicates would look for places to build a still that would not be as noticeable, and so sometimes they would come down to Brunswick County. So Bald Head was kind of a good place for moonshining because it was so remote, and in 1927, the Coast Guard and the Brunswick County deputies, they got a tip uh, that there was a, a moonshining operation going on on Bald Head. So they went and they conducted a raid, they raided the operation, and they found a still, but they, they only found about 20 gallons of, of alcohol, and that wasn't a huge raid. They were like, well, okay, that's fine, but it wasn't what they had in mind. Um, a little bit later, they found, they made a huge discovery. They found a massive dis moonshine distillery that had concrete vats, that could hold 15,000 gallons of liquor. Unfortunately, when they found it, it was abandoned. And even though they watched it and they waited, hoping someone would come back, no one ever did, and they never did figure out whose operation that was that had been going on on Bald Head. 
So generally making the moonshine was the easy part. That had been done for generations. People knew how to do that. And they also knew pretty much how to disguise their, their stills. They'd been doing that for a while. Uh, well, there we go. Okay. So, uh, but the difficult part was delivering the moonshine to their customers in the city. That was new. And their stills were, since their stills were out in the woods, they were hidden, the federal agents could, could focus on trying to find the stills. Or, as we've discussed in previous classes, there weren't that many roads in North Carolina, so they could focus their energies on those roads and patrolling those roads because they knew sooner or later the moonshiners were going to have to be bringing the, the alcohol um, away. Okay, um, so fast cars and brave drivers became the best method for delivering moonshine. And whiskey and moonshine runners became the most skilled wheelmen in the South. So if you were going to be trying to find the best drivers and the fastest drivers, the ones who would uh, be the most confident, who would take the most risks, who would have the, um, they were the most coordinated, had the most sense that they were invincible, who would you use? Does anybody have any idea? All right, I'll tell you, <laughs> teenage boys, okay? So teenage boys were pretty much, um, they, were, they were the ones that were the most confident drivers and the most daring. So and when you think about it, uh, car, the first car that had come to Southport came in 1910. It wasn't someone who was living in Southport that bought a car, it was someone who visited Southport and brought their car with them for up from South Carolina. Now, for all I know, they might have brought something, you know, some alcohol up there with them as well, but they were coming up to visit. And so that's the first time anybody in Southport had seen a car, and we know that because it got written up in the newspaper, it was such a big deal. And then the first car dealer in North Carolina was in, or in Southport was in 1913. So prohibition started in 1919, so imagine, You'd only been around cars for six years, just about that. It's hard to imagine that cars could only, had only existed for that long. People had only been driving for that long. So it really was the young men who were the daredevils, who were the ones that, um, that did the driving. In addition, they knew the roads really well because they had grown up there. They knew, uh, they knew all the ins and outs. They knew all the places to hide. And so they could uh, get away from the, the lawmen. And it was their ability to drive fast and to drive well that was their ticket to making a living and staying out of jail. And they were so confident in their ability to drive well that they would do things like they would, they would cut their brake lights so that they didn't have any brake lights and then they would turn off their headlights and they would drive down these dark roads uh, in, at night to be chased by the police. Now, when they weren't driving moonshine, a lot of times they would be messing around driving cars and of course increasing their skills. They were practicing, but they were also showing off. And so eventually they would start having uh, informal competitions between the different drivers. And that led to the invention of early stock car racing and eventually to NASCAR. And that's how NASCAR became the sport of the South. Now, the key to any successful moonshine operation Besides, you needed a quality product, you needed a good driver, but you also needed a good car. And bootleggers modified their vehicles to get the best possible smuggling space and driving performance. So they would, like a car like this, they would take the back seat out, they would remove it, and then they would load it up with liquor. And then they would put some blankets over it, and they would then maybe stick a kit or two on top of those blankets so that um, it would look like it was a normal back seat, and they would drive that. This was a 1929 Chevy touring car. And what they would do is they would take out the back seat and create a, a false back seat with a, with a built-in door that would go down below the car. And they would do, create these um, box-like traps that ran underneath the car 
that could hold liquor and they could hold 125 to 135 gallon jars of moonshine all hidden underneath the car. Some mechanics would actually move the gas tank so that it was under the floorboards of the car and they would turn the, the uh, traditional gas tank into what was called a sugar, a, a shine tank. And the shine tank would hold moonshine. It could hold about 35 other gallons of whiskey. So bootleggers had money uh, from selling the alcohol. They could use it to soup up their cars. They would modify them. They would get them to running really fast. The federal agents could only use government issued cars. There really was no match. The bootleggers cars were a lot faster. They could put a lot of money into modifying them and they could afford to even lose some of the cars and still make money. But the main rule was the car had to appear stock. It couldn't have any fancy paint jobs or chrome pipes or nice wheels, uh, anything that would make it attract attention. They, they wanted it to look like anybody else's car on the road. And by the 1930s, um, they were more interested in uh, speed than they were about space because they'd rather get more cars to the city than, and, and, than, than how much they traveled at one time. Um, Fords became the vehicles of choice and this is a Ford Model 18. It contained a V8 engine with 65 horsepower and that was much better than the Model A that only had a V4 engine. So this may not look like much but it was actually a pretty good car. So they had the drivers, they had the, the product, they had the cars, and then they just had to transport it. And somebody before had said, would they be putting that into mason jars? And yes, here are the, the mason jars, the canning jars. As I said, it was invented in 1858, uh, right before the war uh, by a man named John Mason. He was only 26 years old when he invented it. What he really invented first was the cap, the screw top cap. And then he invented a way to make standardized bottles that would fit that cap. And it was a really important invention because it was used for canning food. Up until then, people really didn't know about botulism and things like that. They just knew sometimes it was good, sometimes it was bad. So his having sealing like that uh, really helped. And when you think about it, as we said, moonshine was a way of preserving corn. And so it was, uh, another preservation method and it really helped out uh, as far as packaging it and um, transporting it. Now this was, uh, does anybody notice anything about this uh, particular uh, ball jar? Does, it, does somebody say something? Okay. So what was unique about this jar, I don't know if you can tell, but it's square shaped. So Ball Company uh, that produced mason jars, they, uh, they came up across this invention for a while and they actually made the, ball, the jar more square. Now they said, they didn't say that they did this to help moonshiners, but as you can imagine, it would be easier to pack them and easier to transport them if they were square jars. This is a, a variety of the jars made by Ball Company. And over on the left, so you can see the 64 ounce jar, that was the gallon jar, that's what a lot of people wanted to buy. Then right next to it is the 56 ounce jar. And some moonshiners took advantage of that. They used the 56 ounce jar, passed it off as a gallon jar, and then were able to get more jars and obviously get more money for, the, for their um, moonshine because they could sell less for the same price. Here is a picture from Greenville, North Carolina from 1955. And you can see all of the mason jars full of moonshine there. These uh, deputies had managed to, uh, they had a, a high speed chase with this truck. They managed to catch it eventually. And there were 122 gallons in the back of the truck. Now, in case you're wondering what those deputies did with that moonshine, Here's a picture from 1960 in Hertford County where they are dutifully pouring all of it out uh, that they had captured in a raid. So Daniel Pierce, who, who uh, wrote Real NASCAR, the history of NASCAR said, uh, most people in rural areas didn't see making moonshine as illegal. It was a violation of federal law, but that didn't count. And here's what I think is really interesting about North Carolina and moonshining. 
because it seems like there's this big contradiction. On one hand, North Carolina was one of the first states to implement prohibition. But on the other, it was also one of the largest producers of moonshine. And not only that, the moonshiners and bootleggers were often seen as good members of the community rather than criminals. And in some cases, they became beloved folk heroes. So I have a theory about that. You may have noticed over the last four weeks that I have a lot of theories. So you can take them or leave them, make up your own theories. But my theory is that prohibition in North Carolina, the reason that it North Carolina was a leader in prohibition and also in, in moonshining, was that prohibition was really more about abolishing saloons and public drunkenness. Stills, on the other hand, in moonshining, have traditionally always been more about drinking at home or in the woods with your friends and not the public drunkenness out in the streets causing trouble. And also, the, the laws against moonshining were federal laws and it was all about collecting taxes for the, for the federal government. So the moonshiners were seen sort of as rugged individualists and rebels who were thumbing their nose at the federal government, which of course is something that uh, was considered heroic. So here's some of the legendary folk heroes in North Carolina related to moonshining. Uh, the man on the left uh, is Junior Johnson. He was a famous NASCAR driver. Many of you have probably heard of him. Uh, he began running bootleg whiskey when he was 14 years old. He was known for his driving performance, and one of the things he was known for was his ability to turn his car completely around 180 degrees and be able to drive it in the opposite direction all within a single lane. So he had that, that skill. He, uh, as you can see, that picture is of a mugshot. He did go to jail, but he was wanted to make sure people knew that he never went to jail for bootlegging. He never was caught running um, whiskey. He was caught one time uh, because he was trying to help his daddy out. He was, he was already a NASCAR driver. He was already uh, driving um, professionally. And he was home visiting his parents one weekend. And his daddy said in the morning, he said, would you go down and light up the still? So he said, sure. And so he went down and uh, started to fire up the still. And uh, they didn't know that there were federal agents waiting in the woods watching to see who was going to fire up this still. And so they, they caught him doing that. They arrested him. And he spent 11 months in prison. When uh, he got out, he went back to NASCAR racing. And to just kind of demonstrate uh, what folk heroes some of these people were, he was eventually given a full presidential pardon by Ronald Reagan in 1986. The man up in the corner on the right is Popcorn Sutton, and he became famous when he wrote a book about his life called Me and My Liquor, and he appeared in a documentary called something like, that's the last damn batch of moonshine I'm ever going to make, something along those lines. He would say that a lot. He was quite popular in his hometown and with all the people who learned about him from his book and the documentary. He was actually from the, they were both from the western part of North Carolina and uh, Popcorn Sutton was from a county near Tennessee. I forget the name of it now. Um, so we don't have anyone uh, in, in Brunswick County nearly as widely known as Popcorn Sutton or Junior Johnson. But one of the stories that Kim told me seems rather legendary, so I'll tell it to you. It seems that one time her family still needed to be moved from one spot to another. I'm not sure why, maybe they thought it was going to be found or something, it wasn't in a good location. So they decided they needed to move it. And so her uh, grandfather's brother, Gus, decided he would be the one to move it. So he went to the woods where it was and when he got there, he realized, oh, we have all this uh, beer, this mash in there fermenting. This still is really ready to be, um, fired and, and, um, and the, the moonshine made. So he packed it all up real carefully so that he could take it to another spot and they could make the moonshine. And he put it in this, uh, put it on a trailer, hooked it up to his truck and started driving it to the new location. So he got about halfway there. He was in the middle of a big open field and his truck broke down. And so he had to stop, he couldn't go any further. So he starts looking around, he's in the middle, there's no shelter anywhere, he's nowhere near any tree, you know, the trees are all at a distance, he's in the middle of an open area. 
And so he, uh, he realizes he has to fix his truck. And so what he does is he thinks, well, I got to work on my truck anyway. And there's moonshine that needs to be made. And really, what are the odds that someone is going to be watching right then when I'm trying to do, make this moonshine? What are the odds that there's going to be any federal agents around just as I'm doing this? So he decides basically to multitask. He takes the still, he sets it all up, he gets everything going, he, light, he fires up the still and he starts making moonshine. At the same time, he starts working on his truck. So he's doing both at the same time, he's making the whiskey and he's also uh, working on his truck. At the end of the, the time, he's got all the whiskey all made, it's all cooked, it's all distilled, it's all into jars, he's got sits it loaded all back up and by then his truck is running and he takes off very pleased with himself that he'd managed to do that and no one had been any of the wiser, no one had actually seen him. Well, it turned out later, they found out, the family found out that there had been federal agents watching him the whole time. Back in those woods that were surrounding this open field, there were federal agents uh, hiding and watching him do this. But none of them had come down and actually arrested him because they thought no one would be crazy enough to actually make moonshine in the middle of an open field. It was just insane. And so it had to be a trap. They were sure that if, as soon as they came out of the woods and tried to uh, arrest him, that they would get fired on from the woods as an ambush. And so he continued to make his, his moonshine and they continued to watch him from the woods afraid to go down. And they all lived to tell about it at a later date. All right, Junior Johnson said, moonshiners put more time, energy, thought, and love into their cars than any racer ever will. He said, if you lose on the track, you go home. If you lose with a load of whiskey, you go to jail. So we didn't have too many car chases between bootleggers and lawmen in Southport. But in December 1930, Southport's police chief, Ed Leonard, was nearly killed while chasing bootleggers up River Road, just north of town. He was going up River Road, as you can imagine, it's windy, it was not paved at that time, there were no lights, it was very dark, he's racing up the road, they're racing up the road, he's racing up after him, he's thinking he's gaining on them, he's going to pull them over, and all of a sudden, a hail of gunfire came out of that car and, and hit his cruiser, wiped, took out his whole windshield, and bullets were going everywhere around him, and he just barely, narrowly got missed being killed himself. He spun around and rode off the road onto River Road and crashed. Now the culprits got away and I'm sure that he was very disappointed by that, um, but he survived. And he was very fortunate to have survived. Because you know, it's a hundred years since prohibition and we all kind of make light of it now. It seems sort of quaint and charming and harmless compared to some of the things that go on today. And we forget that it was really serious business. During the 14 years of national prohibition, an average of 252 officers died every year. And to give you some perspective, that's two to three times as many as die nowadays every year. So in 1924, two of those lawmen were killed in the northern part of Brunswick County. On July 29, 1924, C.W. Stewart and his son Elmer, they were both moonshiners, they ambushed and killed U.S. Deputy Marshal Samuel Lilly and Detective Sergeant Leon George, who was a liquor enforcement officer with the Wilmington Police Department. This was in the northern part of Brunswick County near Wilmington. The Stewarts were held at the Southport Jail and then they were tried together at the Superior Court, both here in Southport because we were the county seat. About six months later, they were executed on the same day at the Central Prison in Raleigh. So here's a picture of the old jail as it was then and as it is now. And uh, normally I would encourage you to go and visit the jail and get a tour of it and to hear more of the stories. But of course, it, because of the shutdown, uh, the jail is not open right now. It's usually open this time of year.
But I will say next month in May, we're going to be having a virtual tour of the jail. And the curator of the jail is going to be doing a presentation where she'll tell you some of the stories that you would normally hear when you visited the jail. And she'll show you some, of, uh, some pictures of some of the artifacts that are there. So I encourage you to sign up for that and to hear those stories. And then when the jail does open up again, I encourage you to visit it. And this is the Brunswick County uh, Courthouse and City Hall. Uh, I've talked about this before, it's on Moore Street. And again, as I mentioned before, there is an effort underway to save this building. It's being uh, led by Up Your Arts. They wanna turn it into an art space and a community center and their, um, their initiative is called Save the Hall, y'all. So if you see anything about that, be sure. And I think I've mentioned the county, uh, the, the courthouse just about every week when we've been talking. So as you can see, there's a lot of history associated with it. So give that some thought if you hear anything about that. And now I'd like to tell you a couple things, show you a few things that I think are unique to North Carolina when it comes to moonshining. So one of the challenges that we've had in Brunswick County over the years has to do with wild hogs. We've always had wild hogs here and on um, the island on uh, Baldhead. And one of the things that the sheriff deputies noticed when they were out looking for uh, moon sh for stills is that they were not the only ones looking for it. The hogs were also looking for the stills because it turns out the hogs like that fermented mash. You know, it's got sugar, it's, it's got stuff in there, corn. Uh, a lot of times nowadays, people will even use hog feed to, uh, to make uh, moonshine because it's less noticeable when you buy that than if you buy a bunch of corn. So they, uh, they started tracking the hogs instead of just randomly looking through the woods for stills. They would track the hogs, they would follow the hogs, and they would let the hogs lead them to the stills. And the only challenge with that is that they wanted to find it, they wanted the hogs to point out the stills, but they didn't want the hogs to get there too far ahead of, of them, because the only thing worse than wild hogs is drunk wild hogs. And once they got into that beer, into that fermented mash, uh, they did get drunk. Now, this is the smallest um, still that was ever found in North Carolina. As you can see, this is from Hertford County. It was found in 1957. And as you can see, it was made out of a motor oil can. And just over there coming off of it, you can see what looks like a little teeny tiny um, ball jar, mason jar. I don't know exactly what it is, but that's what it looks like. And that's the smallest still that was ever found in North Carolina. And then this is the largest still. This one here was found in Birdie County in 1951, and it held 32,000 gallons. And this last one I wanna show you uh, is another reason why know your moonshiner. Uh, this one was made, this one was made in 1971, they found this one, and as you can see, they're using a, a trash can for the, the, uh, to hold the worm. A lot of times the worms, they used radiator parts for the worm. Uh, they're using a wash tub for the thumper keg. Those, those hoses going between the different parts do not look like copper cables to me. So, as you can see, people got, uh, there was a lot of ingenuity put into it, but not always something that you actually would want to consume. Now, you may be wondering what would happen when they found these stills. Uh, if they were a small still like this, they, could, they would destroy them. Uh, a lot of times they could take an ax and they could uh, just uh, chop them up so that they were unusable. They would always take the worm. The worm was the, uh, the deputy's proof that he'd actually destroyed a still, so he would take the worm. They would turn that in. Frank Stevenson's uh, father, when he would turn them in, would get $5 per worm when he would turn that in, which uh, was an awful lot of danger and risk and, and hard work to get that $5 worm. If they were a big still, they would blow them up. This is a picture of a still uh, in North Carolina that they found in 1960. They used 110 sticks of dynamite to blow this up. And they said when they, after they did it, there was mash dripping from the trees. And for some reason, they don't know, one barrel, after 110 sticks of dynamite, one barrel was still left standing in the middle of the, this mess. But they did blow up the whole still. 
All right, so that is the end of my presentation on moonshining. Next week, we'll be talking about the rest of the story. We'll be talking about prohibition, and we'll be talking about smuggling in Southport. So I'm going to turn this back around and see if anybody has any more questions. All right, have a little sip of my water. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions? Liz, so uh, moonshine is clear. Um, I, 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 so we don't know what you're drinking right now. Right, right. Um, the, uh, for bourbon, for example, what they do is they put the resultant mixture into a, an oak barrel after it's been charred, I guess, burned a little bit. And the color of the barrel leaches out into the clear liquid, and that's why bourbon isn't clear. But it could be. Oh, that's interesting. So is bourbon aged then? Is that another difference where moonshine? No, it's no. not aged. It's kind of interesting. I, I finally found out why older bourbon is more expensive. It's because it evaporates. Oh. So it's a, it's, there's less of it, so it costs more, the older it's, stuff. Interesting. It's okay. not better. It's still just older and less of it. Okay. All right, so bourbon's like Kentucky moonshine yeah. then. And by the way, I don't want you to judge me on all this bourbon knowledge. <laughs> I'm, I'm admiring you. Does anybody, uh, anybody else have any, any comments? Um, my husband's grandfather used to drive from Tennessee, eastern, eastern Tennessee, all the way to Florida to smuggle sugar from Cuba for really? the liquor industry in Tennessee. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Yeah, and you know, that was one of the things when I was researching um, moonshining in North Carolina, because it continued on during uh, World War II, and of course, sugar was very much rationed. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and so sometimes they would say, there was one where they found a still in North Carolina that had, uh, they realized they would have had to use, they used 900, um, pounds of sugar and like where are they getting all this sugar and you know there's cooks you know these poor housewives that didn't have sugar and then they had all of this sugar that they were using to make the um to make the moonshine and where were they getting it right. when uh in frank stevenson's book he mentioned that his father whenever they would destroy a still if there were bags of sugar there they would uh his father would distribute them to people who were in need mm -hmm. Unless they had ants in them, you know, if they had holes in the bags and they had ants in them, then he would leave them to be. But if they were still intact, he would redistribute those among the poor parts of the world. Hey, Liz. This is Larry. Hi, oh, Larry. Hey, how you doing? Uh, it's this been... Uh-oh, you cut out, Larry. Turn your mic back on. Can you turn okay. it on now? You're good oh, now. Oh, thanks. Can you hear me now? Yep. Well, I went to college in 1972 in Jackson County, which is, uh, you know, due west of Asheville and uh, up way up there in the western part of North Carolina. Very remote uh, area uh, called Tullowee, North Carolina, where Western Carolina is. Uh, right there in the heart of the Smoky Mountains, you know. You only had to go about 30 miles south, and you were in South Carolina, where you could get access back then to 6.0 beer or you can go 45 minutes and hit yourself over the Georgia line and get your six point beer there. But otherwise, Jackson County didn't have beer, but you could get your liquor, but you couldn't find any beer. You get your wow. liquor. Now, I was just a college guy back then, but to make a, a long story short, I met this dude who lived up the road in the mountains. He was 80, about 80 years old. We could say his name, his name was Leon Hooper. I'm sure he's gone by now, but he was a moonshiner, but he was a retired moonshiner at that time. I was only about 20, but he befriended me and my college mates because every time he got his check in the mail, we take him over to Haywood County to get his beer. You know, if you drove him there, he gave you a case of beer, which was kind of nice. But he taught us about a little bit about moonshine. And he says, you got to make sure you have good moonshine and the way to test it. And his technique was to pour a little bit of that moonshine in a in a, like a bottle cap and put a match to it. Now, if it blew, that was good stuff right there. You can you could drink that. 
But if it burnt yellow or smoked, there was impurities and you better not take it in. Okay. So that was my only experience at the time of someone who actually did moonshine, but he wouldn't show us, he wouldn't show us anything on how to do it or how to make it. But he did tell, tell us how to tell if he had some good stuff or not. Well, that was good for passing on those, those tips. <laughs> I've heard uh, if it's red, I've heard like if there's lead in it, that it will flame red. And the expression is, if it's red, you're dead. But I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not sure there is. A, I, I don't know how to tell whether it's safe or not. Anybody else? Liz, you got somebody on the chat that said, uh, Donna, that, thank you, Liz. Great lecture, and I learned a, I learned a lot. Uh, so you, you have, we have a, you have a couple a couple of those uh, <coughs> thank yous from. Oh, okay. People just saying thank you before they left. Yep. Okay. okay. All oh, right. Thank you. You're welcome, Linda. Any anybody else got anything they want to ask? Um, Liz. Yes. It um. Is the 211, Route 211, Green Swamp area a big area that moonshine could have been used for? I would think that the Green Swamp would be. I don't have any specific stories from there, but um, yeah, the swamps were a, a good place to, uh, to hide. Right, it's pretty remote, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, I know that there was one, I read an article where there was one on Beaver Creek um, outside of Southport. Uh, which would seem like a good, a good spot. Mm. Since I live on Beaver Creek, I kind of like that. <laughs> good idea. <laughs> Pat Kirkman knows where the liquor is. is. Mm -hmm. What you say, <laughs> Pat? You know where the liquor is? Is that what? I thought. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So next week we'll talk about uh, prohibition and uh, the sort of the flip side of of moonshine. So uh, I hope that you guys will, will join us. See you then. Thanks, Liz. Okay, bye-bye.